what do we learn about the post-Pentecost church in Acts chapter 2? They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's the first thing we're told. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. The breaking of bread, kai tais prosiuchais, the prayers. The point is this. The first characteristic of the post-Pentecost church is they were devoted to the apostles' teaching ministry, the fellowship of the breaking of bread and the prayers. Breaking of bread was in Holmes, verse 46, teaches us the temple prayers were the only thing you could refer to in those days as the prayers. They received instruction as instruction. But they didn't receive the ideas of men as instruction. Paul is talking here about valuing the instruction received from the Word of God. Anyone who receives instruction, Galatians 6, 6, in the Word, must share all good things with his instructor. Now, I'm about to say something really very important here. Painfully simple, coming from our Welsh evangelical culture, I'm afraid we might miss it. It's painfully simple, but we haven't got hold of this in Wales. The focus of the preaching ministry is not the preaching ministry. Let us think in a minute, and then I'll say, what do I mean? <laughs> yeah, okay. I've frequently heard people say they love preaching. They love preaching. What a terrible fundamental error that is. I love preaching. If you focus on preaching rather than receiving instruction in the word of the God who speaks, sometimes through preaching, then you will rapidly find yourself living on the experience of hearing oratory and cherishing that, but departing from the God who speaks in his word. Ask me how I know? Because as a young preacher, I was really good at what's being called preaching. When I stood in a Greek class in a Bible college, and I gave a ten minute word that had people laughing at the right points, and applauding at the right points, and, yeah. and he was elderly even then, Dick Lucas, who had been brought in to do this, who stood up. I can't do the impersonation of Dick Lucas, I wish I could, right? But he took off his little glasses and he blinked. And he said, I was waiting. What's he going to say? It was good, wasn't it? Do you blow up? I tremble for you. And he took me to pieces. Oh, he took me to very small pieces. And he was absolutely right to do so because the preaching was, had become the focus of the ministry of the word of the God who speaks. Okay? Christians are fundamentally those who are submitted to the authority of the God who speaks in his word. That is the root, that is the foundation of repentance, that's what repentance is about, and that is always the consequence of saving faith, the faith that saves that Paul's been talking about in Galatians. They receive his word, and they consequently are keen to receive instruction in his word, which is why the post-Pentecost church devoted itself to the apostles' teaching and so on and so on. We feed our souls as we hear the word of life, not as we hear the sermon. And hopefully, hopefully they, they coincide, you know, in a good, on a good day. Yeah. But that is what gives life to our souls, the word of God. And as the instructor feed our souls in the word of God, we commit ourselves with a parallel fervor to feeding the instructor's body so that he can come back next week and feed our souls again. And if you cherish that, You'll make sure it happens. This is what the strife ridden Galatian church had let go of. They couldn't use money to try to manipulate the ministry the way they were doing, because by doing so, they were biting at the hand that fed their souls. And how daft is that? So, where's the onus in what Paul is saying? Paul says, The onus is on you. Me, you know, us, right? But he's saying you, because he's in somewhere else in there in Galatia. I can't remember where he is, but you, know, you get the puff. Let me off that. The owner says Paul is on you, you who receive instruction in the word of God, to whose authority you submit, if indeed you believe in him, if indeed you submit to his authority and feed on his word, as all true Christians will do, because of their repentance and faith. The onus is on you who receive this instruction to do what? 
And let's be clear about this because I think you could really get the wrong idea of what I'm saying. Is the onus on you to provide your trophy pasta with a big name, with a trophy Mercedes Benz, a six bed trophy mansionette, uh, I read mansionette, it's mansionette, uh, a salary commensurate with, uh, with, with what they get in the secular world, in business, in the corporate structure? Although, why not? <laughs> you get any idea? Well, maybe, it depends on you, but. Because what the Bible says here we to do is to share. To share, to reciprocate. Those who receive instruction in the Word should share good things. What if they haven't got many good things? It's a bit obvious, isn't it? Don't share them then, because you haven't got them. If you receive good things, share good things. That, that's the big important principle that lies at the root of the question, how much, isn't it? Share is the, is the principle, isn't it? The person who gives up on his daily bread winning time to be able to do all he will need to do in order to be able to feed your soul, share. Be share. Be sure that you share the fruits of your bread winning time with that person. Don't share what you don't have. You share what you do have. What should you share? All good things. So often it's the minister that's first called on to meet an individual's or the church's financial needs. That's what happens. That's sharing bad things with him, <laughs> isn't it? Should be sharing good things. Now I know there are lots of things, good things, that, that cry out for our money to be given to. We're doing a very, very needy word. I know, I know there are lots of things that cry out for our time to be given to. That cry out for our encouragement to be given to help to be given to. It's really difficult to prioritise your giving, isn't it? Let's hear what Paul is and isn't saying here. You'll always have the poor with you, and Jesus says you can do them good if you've got a mind to. But these Galatians were in a transaction. It's not a charity, it's a transaction. That's a really, oh, you're looking at me as if that's neat, but I'm going to do that in a minute. This is, this is a transaction. You receive, says Paul, you share. It's a transaction. It's not a charitable giving. Uh, let me give you an instance. There are people who have, from time to time, tried to support our ministry, and I know we're very different. Uh, but but they've, they've come to see us, and they wanted to know what our bills are. It's not a charity, it's a transaction. And they, they wanted, they've had lists of questions. Uh, how much you pay for electricity? How, how much you pay for your water? How much do you have to pay for petrol for your car and how many miles do you do a year for the church? It's, it's not a charity. It's a transaction. Just the point. What are your needs? No, no, no. What am I doing? <laughs> do you see the point? And this isn't appreciated. It's not understood. And I hope you take it with grace and I hope you take it with... You know, whatever. But see the point? Okay, so we've looked at this principle, and I'm skipping a lot because time is gone. The principle is that those who receive instruction in the Word of God share their good things. Where are the, where are the holes in what I'm saying? Where are the anomalies in my argument? Very quickly. Well, there's missionary funding. There's the big anomaly. Because missionary funding should be done by tent making, shouldn't it? Because that's what Paul did. Nobody threw anything then. Nobody, nobody, you know, I don't mean money. I mean nobody threw, <laughs> threw chairs or anything, you know? Why? Rubbish. What sort of rubbish is that argument? You know the passage of scripture I'm referring to? Here's the background. In, uh, where's this, Acts 18. Paul left Athens, went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. So Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. What's happened? Paul's been in Athens in Acts 17. And Paul has got, he has cracked open the biggest preaching gig of his life, okay? Sometimes it comes your way. And he goes along to speak in front of the Areopagus. Now that is full of all the intellectual types, okay, Caleb? 
It's full of all the real brain boxes. We've studied all this philosophy and stuff from the ancient world, the Greek stuff. Okay? So Paul goes in there, and what does he talk to them about? God. Yeah, you'd think. But he does it in such an unrooted in the Bible way. They're clever people. We need to talk to them with clever stuff. So he quotes their philosophers. Have you heard sermons like this? I've got a classic case in my head by an outstanding guy who felt that what he had to do at this student context mission was to you know, keep coming in with philosophers and literature people, uh, literary people and, and artists. And, and where's the Bible? And who was saved? Now Paul goes out of there, having won very few converts, with his tail pretty much between his legs, and he bumps straight to Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica it all kicks off bad stuff, with some Jews who come over and kicked up the riot. And, and then he uh, gets out of there, he gets into Berea, and it's all in Berea. Oh, they were much more, much more noble character in Berea than the Thessalonians. And they, they check the scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was true. It's great, what can you ask for as a preacher? And Paul got out of that situation because the Jews were coming over again. And he got off down into Corinth. He's on his own. He's had to leave behind his missionary support infrastructure. His supply lines have been cut because he's left Silas and guys like that behind him in Berea to sort out the little church there, at least give him some pattern of leadership and Bible ministry, which will be his life. So now he's on his own in Corinth. Moral cesspit of the Mediterranean world. Where's he going to live? What's he going to do? Some people take the needy preacher into their home. They're called Aquila and Priscilla. And they've got a little business running. And because he sees what they're doing and how they're making their living, which is supporting him, he helps out. Because he can do that. Because he's a temporary. What is this? Is this a temporary expedient that's been stumbled upon? He's been provided for by these believers in their home. And he helps them with what they're doing. Is it a temporary experience because missionary support supply lines have been cut? Or is this a, a strategy for supporting church planting missionary? Is it a missional strategy for winning the world? Which is it? I said it in too long a sentence so you can't actually respond. But believe you me, this is no mission, biblical missionary strategy for reaching the world for Christ. And we know that because as soon as the others come in, verse 5 of, of Acts 16, as soon as, as soon as Silas and Timothy, he'd left them instructions to come as fast as they could, see what it says in 1 Corinthians, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching because the missionary support infrastructure is now back in place. The team has arrived and they support him. To be doing the full-time job. Have you heard that before? You don't want to come here. You don't want to listen to these videos because I'm a dangerous man and I go to this book called the Bible and I get stuff out of it. It's really dodgy. Do you see the point? Tent making is not a biblical strategy. It's not a biblical strategy for church planting. It is what Paul was forced into doing when the proper missionary logistics strategy got suddenly and unexpectedly dislocated the way it does in the fog of battle. Spiritual battle. And as soon as the team caught back up with him at Corinth, having made provision for the new church at Berea by teaching Christian basics, putting ministry in place and eldership and so on, then the unsatisfactory temporary expedient was dispensed. Paul writes to the Galatians, Galatians 6.6, 6, those who receive instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. There is no inconsistency here with what happened at Corinth. He was provided for by believers, but as his business was their business, he helped them out. What Paul is writing to these Galatians about deliberately not doing is this. Yes, you too can go onto the internet and find a photo of a muzzled ox. Isn't that marvellous? And doesn't it explain such a lot? I once knew some guys uh, on one of these open farms years ago where the cash crop on the open farm wasn't actually the animals or the meat or anything else. It was actually young people with learning difficulties who were given 
proper jobs on the farm, great worthy thing to do. They spent the mornings mucking out and the afternoons larking about on the farm. They got paid for it and they had to turn up, I don't know, 38 weeks of the year and do a proper shift and, you know, yeah, it was, it was great. Great, good stuff, 48 weeks of the year, yeah. And, uh, of course, what do you do in the afternoon with them then? You find other things around the farm that you can do, but there's only so many times in an afternoon you can mend the fence or dig a drain. <laughs> What happened to be? What do you do? Well, one, one particular guy, I remember him well, and he, 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 he hit on the idea of using some of these Sussex cattle around the place as draft animals to drag things around, to move stuff around the farm. Pulling things about on the farm, that's fine. But these things, these animals, these Sussex cattle they wanted to turn into draft animals were actually, they turned out to be serious minded grazing animals. Right? And you've got to get over this problem. If you want to turn serious minded grazing animals into serious minded draft animals, You've got to get through that, because otherwise they just have to graze. You put something on a sort of rock behind them somewhere, and instead of going where you want them, you go, there's a bit of grass here, look. <laughs> We're going to have a bit of grass here. Oh, fantastic. If you wanted to turn those grazing mines wholeheartedly to drawing things along, you had to feed them intensively outside of their pulling things work hours, so they'd be full in their tummies, so when they came to pull it, they think, oh, this is interesting. What should we do here? We'll, we'll have a pull. Let's have a pull. Oh, we'll all have a pull together. See the point? Let me take you back to the ancient world. In the days before Bibby's Feeds, or Winstead, or BOCM, now things come in a bag. Right? In those days, the most energy-intensive feeding time of a draft ox's life, in the times that we are dealing with, was when he was trudging round with a spar on his le neck, like in the picture, turning the wheels that grind the corn. He wasn't working hard, the lever was effective, it wasn't desperately energy-demanding work, and it was a chance for him to get some high-protein feed into him to set him up for a hard day's work in the fields. He's not doing that for long of a day, but he's getting his high-energy feed into him while he's doing that to be able to go off and work out in the field all day without being distracted by every passing leaf of clover. Making sense? Feed him well, he's going to work well in your fields for the rest of his day. Don't feed him well, you won't get much out of him because he'll need to be stopping all the while to deal with his basic legitimate needs. You won't get much out of him. Paul says, don't muzzle the ox while he's treading out the corn. I've served three churches that have emerged in those three places during the course of my church planting word ministry. They haven't emerged in easy places. The first one I was funded. I have a house to live in, a pension at the end of the day. And I could be dedicated to it and it grew very fast from a terribly low base and an awful situation that it came out of. And in four and a half years it was a viable church in itself through conversion growth. Because I could be dedicated to it. But then things started to decay in the church in the West. And the second job was partly funded. And it took 10 years then to get to any condition we could leave it in. <laughs> there we go. How many here today? How long have we been here? Seven years. It's taken ages. Is that sheer coincidence? That's not a moan. It's what we've got. It's just the way it is. But those are the implications. If you muzzle your ox, he has to go off and spend his working day picking up bits here and there. It's a highly unsatisfactory temporary expedient in Paul's experience, and as soon as he could get away from it, he did. It was deployed only when mission logistics had failed, and then it was only until more normal missionary service could be resumed by the coming of those and by the gifting of those who actually valued being taught the word of God. Here it is. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple? Those who serve at the altar share what's offered on the altar? In the same way the Lord has commanded those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Paul wouldn't accept payment from the unconverted to support the gospel. We'd, we'd shriek and shout about that, wouldn't we? Because we're evangelicals. But what's the alternative? Now that's an important principle, of course, to assert in connection with the Adrodian issue here. Or, or the, the church tax that people have to pay in Norway comes out of their wages whether they like it or not. 
It's important to assert the principle of Isaiah 55. It does speak about God's invitation to people who are in the darkness to come and drink the waters of salvation without money and without price. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about those who are Christians who gladly receive instruction in the world, sharing with their instructors. See that red thing on there? That says conclusion. So go on a bit. The point is, you don't pay for the ministry of God's word if you are unconverted, but those who are converted, who are on side with it, who support it, who receive the ministry of the word of God as authoritative and grow because of that, they should share all good things with their instructor. Not you Galatians, withhold it. Not you Galatians, cut it off if you're not hearing what you want to hear. Not you Galatians, use money as a means of ministry control. How many people wear flat jackets to church? All over. Judging the sermon according to preconceived criteria to protect themselves from its implication which will change my life. They seem to be doing that with the ministers they didn't like the sound of in, in North Galatia who were faithfully uncomfortably trying to minister to them. I'm getting things wrong. See what's going on. Greek culture had a way, a, a pre-understanding of how to support is wandering philosophers. They had a, a, a cultural template for doing that. They knew how to do it. Jewish culture had a cultural template for how to support its wandering rabbis and scribes and people who came through. They had a template for doing that. They knew how to do that. Tribal Celtic culture in North Galatia may have lacked that. Certainly, contemporary culture in Wales doesn't know how to do that. People have often told me confidentially, you know, Boy, Wales is funny about money. Wales is funny about money. Do you know what? It's not just a church thing. People in business tell me that contracts in Wales require bricks without straw always. And they'd far rather do business across the border in England. Well, they know that bricks require straw. Well, you know, I'm using a the metaphor there, aren't I? We have a cultural problem with paying for things. We do, because we're in Wales. And we need to get back to the social justice and the biblical principle of a fair day's, day's pay for a fair day's work and to take pride in doing that. Some guys came around this year and did some shearing for me. And they only sheared a few and they only thought, oh, we can't ask him too much, he's, he's a rev and you know, there's only a few sheep here, we can't ask him much. But they've come, they've travelled, they've said that, there's a few of them, you know. And they say, oh, we like X. And I say, no, 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 you're having that. And they, no, 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 I'm sorry. It's fair. What's the matter with this guy? What's the matter with his head? <laughs> there's an important spiritual principle in there. You've got to watch that. You've got to watch it in Wales. And we've got to be countercultural about this in the Church of God. Here's the principle that the Scripture lays down for us. Convinced Christians, not de facto outsiders, whatever membership list or whatever else cultural allegiance they have to a particular place of worship, convinced Christians receive instruction in the Word. And they share those good things with their instructor. And when there isn't a body of people already in place to do that, we form mission teams. Here's our mistake. We form mission teams who work alongside world servants to provide for their needs and receive gifts from established churches who devote themselves out of gratitude for God and His gospel to supporting such work. Until believers are gathered together. Because anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Here's the principle. 